I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Today on The James Altucher Show. Once again, Stephen Pressfield. I had a uh, weird question to ask him in the beginning. When I first interviewed him, which I think was 2016, I, I forget the question exactly, but he said, I've sacrificed everything to do my writing. And so this time, the very first question I had was, what exactly did you mean then? Even though he's been on the podcast since then, and I could have asked him at any point, what did you mean? What exactly did you sacrifice? And that starts us off on a whole conversation that circles round and round many different topics. And we also cover his most recent book, A Man at Arms, which is a very enjoyable novel. But more than that, we cover everything about how do you find the code you're going to live your life by? Here's Steve Pressfield. So, Steve Pressfield, thanks for joining the podcast once again. I think this is your third or fourth time on. Uh, I think it's the third. Huh? The third, last yeah. time we did it at your comedy club in, in New York at the studio in your comedy club, right? Am I right? Yeah, yeah. First time was in Malibu. Second uh, time was in New yes, York. Yes, you came and, and then, visited, yeah. And then third is now on Zoom. I think the first time was one of the few times you had been on podcasts at that point. Yeah, I didn't even know what a podcast was then, yeah. Now you're a podcast regular. <laughs> I'm getting I'm, I'm getting more into it, that's for sure. So we're talking uh, at least a little bit about A Man in Arms, which just came out, your first historical novel in 13 years. There's a lot of things I want to get to about this book and the different themes and the archetype of the, the hero and some other stuff that you've written about in the past. But there's one thing from our fir very first podcast that I wanted to ask you about that I've been wondering ever since our very first podcast. At the end, I was getting ready to leave and you said, you know, to do this writing life, you know, and you had a beautiful place in Malibu and very quiet and, and it's where you did all your writing. You said to have this life, you had sacrificed much to get to that point. And I was always curious what you meant. Oh, you know, I remember that. that I remember that vividly because you asked me, you know, and it was a surprise question to me. You asked me, what did I, what had I sacrificed? What had I given up? And my answer was, I said everything. Right. That was yeah, and I and I think I didn't pursue it after that, which yeah, now we I have were, the courage we, to pursue. You were it. leaving. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been thinking I've been thinking about that and uh just for myself, you know. And well, like I don't have kids. That's one thing, you know. 
So I sacrificed the idea of having a family. And that very much was a conscious decision along the way, you know, anytime when opportunities came up and a fork in the road where I could have gone that way, you know, and I thought to myself, if I do that, I'll never be able to be a writer. You know, I'll have to get like a real job. I'll have to take care of kids. And and I made that decision, you know, the way you make it, you know, as you're going along. And um, so in, in a lot of ways, that, that's one thing that, uh, you know, the writer's life is not like, I mean, you know this very well. It's not like, it's not a normal life. It's like being a professional athlete or being somebody that climbs Mount Everest or does something, you know, that that's someone that's dedicated to a calling of one kind or another. And you do have to give up a lot of the sort of humanish stuff, you know, that people live and call a regular life. You know, there's a great quote from Henry Miller, which I wish I could recite, but the gist of it was something like, he says something like, uh, I realized that I had never really been interested in life if that's what other, if what other people call life is what they're doing. But only he said what I'm doing right now, meaning writing, meaning creating, meaning, you know, being living the creative life or whatever, you know, entering your unconscious and bringing stuff and coming back with it. And that's maybe an overstatement for me, but it's something like that. So, yeah, I, I really do feel like I kind of gave up, you know, a normal life with family and stuff like that. And, you know, you mentioned the kids thing first. Is that, do you think that weighs on you a little bit every now and then? A little bit, you know, um, you can't look back, you know, yeah. it is what it is. And uh, you can't have everything in this life and you can't do everything in this life. And at certain forks in the road, I chose one fork and for better or for worse, that's my life. You know, do you ever feel like when you're around other, you know, friends or neighbors or whatever and and you feel like they're all the adults and somehow you're not you're not an adult like them uh, i'm sure when you ask that question james you feel that way don't yes, you yes i of course i'm asking for myself yeah well actually it's funny because i sort of do feel that way but at the same time i'm now old enough that i'm really sort of uh in the mentor sage category you know i mean people come to you know look look to me for advice, but I feel like I'm 22 years old and I'm the youngest kid in the room. And uh, so, yeah, I, but I think that also is sort of part of the creative life that, that does keep you young in a way. I mean, you know a lot of comedians, right? And they're, yeah. they remain kind of kids, even if they're like, you know, Judd Apatow or whatever, however you pronounce his name, who's like producing, directing and doing all kinds of, you know, grown up stuff. I'm sure in his mind, I'm sure Bill Murray in his mind feels like he's, you know, 14 years old and will never change. So, um, yeah, I do feel that way. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the the mentor role you've been taking. I mean, your, your writing has gone down two strains, of course. One is your, your novels, which include, you know, uh, a man at arms, which, which is coming out, uh, as this podcast is being released, of course, you know, gates of fire, legend of bagger Vance, ties of war. And also we did a podcast about your book, The Knowledge. Yeah. That was your novel about your time as a cab driver in, in New York. But then, you know, you've written all these books called The War of Art, Turning Pro, The Authentic Swing, uh, and my personal favorite, Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit. Uh, so, and The Artist's Journey. So you've really kind of gone down two lanes with your writing. One's been kind of this, men one's been a real source of inspiration for probably millions of writers at this point about how tough, you know, creating art is, how it's, you know, you even just wrote something about Seth Godin's The Practice, how practice is not preparation for the game, it is the game. And that's a very meaningful term that I'm sure artists relate to. And then on this other lane, you know, you have these historical novels and, you know, and then some more contemporary ones. Do you decide, like, what's next? Like, is it every other book is going to be the inspirational one? Or like, what's... <laughs> What do you, cause how would, how, it's always hard when you're writing kind of inspirational stuff to come up with new things. There's only so many things that are inspirational. Uh, I don't know if I would call that, like the war of art or something like that inspirational. I'm not it, sure it, what it I is, call though. it, but, but it, you know, you know, I'll just say really quickly why I think it's inspirational is because things that are worth doing are not 
necessarily enjoyable. They're enjoyable because you love them, but they're not by themselves enjoyable. That's why it's a war. That's why people get resistance in some sense is because it's not fun to write. No, it's not. It's just like it's not fun to be an extreme athlete or something like that or run ultra marathons or any of those sort of arduous or to be in the military or to be a single mom or, you know, it's 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 anything that's worthwhile is really hard. But back to kind of what you were what you were saying, I, I don't think I ever set out or thought of like in the war of art or the other books to like inspire anybody, because mainly a lot of that stuff in those books is t tough love, you know? It's really sort of saying, you know, this stuff is hard, you know? And and um, and and uh, if there's any inspiration, it's just sort of get used to it, you know? If you want to do this, there's a price to pay for it. But I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to like inspire anybody. I'm just trying to kind of, t I, I'm almost writing those books, James, for myself, you know? Right. I'm kind of talking to myself in them. And, and a lot of times I'll, I won't even know what I'm going to say in some, in a book of like that until I write it. Cause I'm sort of, ex I'm asking myself, what do I think about the theme of a novel or the, th or, or what a story is about, or what do I think about characters? Or what do I think about the discipline of it? And I don't even know until I start that. So it's very educational for me. You know, I'm sort of amazed as each chapter comes out. And each one has been, they're, they're very short books. I encourage people to read all of them. Each one blows me away with a different concept, like the artist's journey, for instance, the, the process of creating a work of art almost often mimics the hero's journey, which the artist in some cases might be writing about. And I love that parallel. And in one of my favorites actually is The Authentic Swing, where you showed how you basically took this 2,500-year-old piece of text, the Bhavagad Gita, uh, and beat by beat, put it on the, the plot, the story of the legend of Bagger Vance. And you describe that in, in detail. And I just, I think that's a very powerful concept. And I've tried it a few times, even with articles where I take an old piece of text and map it onto a modern concept. And it's a really powerful thing to do. Definitely. I mean, a lot of people do it all the time, you know? I mean, the Odyssey, you know, how many people have redone that? I mean, one of my, um, do you remember that movie, The Warriors? Yeah, of course. About the gangs in New York? I think I had, um, you know, I didn't, one of the actors from The Warriors I met and we were going to do a podcast, but then it, it sort of drifted away. But yes, I, I've seen that movie many times. But there's, it was, you know, totally, I'm sure you know this, it was stolen from Xenophon's Anabasis from 2,500 years ago. The idea of- I did not know that. <laughs> story of this Greek army that went into the heartland of Persia, three months, fought a battle and lost, and then had to fight their way back through wild tribe after wild tribe. So I forgot who did the warriors. It was somebody, somebody good, but they just mimicked the whole thing. And I've always thought, that's a great concept. You could do you could do a movie, you could do movie after movie on that, you know? Somebody that goes deep into some alien territory, loses and has to come back against enemy after enemy after enemy. It's a natural. So I'm a big believer in stealing yeah. you know, concepts that work. Well, after I read that book, I remember I did an article, I think for TechCrunch, and this was like an article, you know, that's a blog for entrepreneurs for tech entrepreneurs. And so I took um, a line from the Yoga Sutras, which are the nine impediments to meditation. And I did the, the nine impediments to be, or the nine, nine ways you could fail as an entrepreneur. And word for word, I took the line, like uh -huh. I didn't change a single one of the nine. And it was one of my most popular uh, articles that year. I'll bet, I think I might even have seen that, you know, cause, or if I didn't see that, I saw something that was very much like it, you know, but, you're right. It absolutely works. The parallels are always, always the same, you know, and it's, if it's some sort of internal thing that you have to fight your way through, right. To to reach focus or to reach stillness or to reach, you know, some sort of a deeper level of consciousness, the same impediments are going to come up that are going to be an impediments to, to having a tech business or to do a startup or to write a book or to write a movie or anything. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it, it was all of this was making me think while I was reading this book, A Man at Arms, your your latest book. First off, you write many times about the the hero's journey, hence the book, The Artist's Journey. 
and you know the the arc of the hero and this very this book very much fit um the the arc of the hero it was like a it was like the arc of the hero in its purest distillation like and i, I won't get into the, the you know the trick, tricky part of doing a podcast about novels i don't want to give away in any of the the plot or anything like that but you know just the way you know, it, it almost reminded me a little of star wars some aspects of the the plot how you know the beginning character is you know uh, you know gets the call to action has you know problems along the way of course and then meets more and more of his compatriots and and so on you know the the whole the all the beats of the arc of the hero but then you write about you had a recent blog post the idea of uh it was called the idea for a man in arms and you talked about um the the theme of get to I love you where you take two characters who are as far apart as possible at the start of the story then structure a narrative in such a way that by the end they have come together so you combine that with the arc of the hero combined with 55 AD, Jesus, Rome, everything, and you've got this amazing novel. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know how other people write, but that's definitely the way I do. Uh, you know, I um, another thing that I would throw in there for this particular book uh, is is the concept of a, of a Western movie. Like, I also thought of this as a Western, even though it's set in 55 AD. But I thought, you know, the the classic Western, if you think of like a Clint Eastwood man with no name character or a samurai movie, like any samurai movie, like the seven samurai or something, you usually have uh, the hero is like a lone gunslinger, right? Whether it's Shane or whoever it is, you know, any, any Clint Eastwood role. And usually they're a, they're a hard bitten personality that's been through some kind of hell and has evolved their own kind of code, right? And if you think about the movie Logan, did you see that of the Wolverine? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, or even um, John, the John Wick movies are kind of like yeah. this, you know? They've had, like his wife was killed, his dog was killed, and you know, that kind of thing. And they're usually it's like a hard-bitten character, like a, um, anything with Jason Statham in it is this character <laughs> too. Or even Vin Diesel's a lot of these things, right? And then usually there's a, a character that's a vulnerable character that they encounter that needs to, needs to be helped, you know, like Jason Statham in his transporter movies or something like that. Or in Logan, the Wolverine, he encounters this young girl. It's like yeah. a mutant, you know, whatever. And that hard bitten Western hero type character, Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven, right? It's the prostitutes in the town, the girl who got her face scarred, right? And he comes to, you know, and they, they, the Western hero sort of has to make a decision. Is he going to be all for himself alone or is he going to, you know, reach out and, and, and connect with somebody else? Even if you think about the movie Casablanca, Humphrey Bogart, which is, you don't think of as a Western, but it really is a Western. You know, he's the sort of gunslinger. And in the end, you know, he puts Ingrid Bergman on the plane to Lisbon and he chooses you know, a selfless act instead of a uh, a selfish act. And if you think about Casablanca, it even ends with a gunfight, you know, where he shoots Major Strasser, the Nazi guy. Strasser pulls out his Luger and a bogey pulls out a gun and guns him down, right? So th that was another sort of, as I'm writing A Man at Arms, that's a kind of a you know, a template or a paradigm or something that I that I sort of had in mind along with the others. The Western movie. That's interesting because you know it's while I was reading A Man in Arms, I kept thinking to myself, "Boy, I really want to watch The Mandalorian now." Because some parts of it remind yeah, me yeah, of yeah. Uh, the yeah. Star Wars of The Mandalorian, and The Mandalorian yeah. is structured like a Western as well, even though it's of course in a distant galaxy, far, far away. Yeah, in fact, when I first saw the thing of The Mandalorian, there was this new show. I kind of pissed in my pants. I thought, "Oh no, you know, somebody's doing something very similar to what I'm doing." You know, and it's already out there. But, uh, but but Star even Star Wars though George Lucas intended that for to be like a science fiction western, so yeah. he took he took the arc of the hero the story of Jesus and what and westerns and science fiction and mashed it together and he had yeah. Han Solo was his hard bitten character exactly exactly yeah and and I guess you could say the, the you know the Han Solo Princess Leia sub story was the get to I love you theme yeah I guess so. It's funny because Harrison Ford, if you if you watch that movie, the lines that come out of his mouth are kind of classic 
hard bitten Western hero stuff, you know, like kid, I don't get involved in that sort of that sort of thing, right? He yeah. always wants to the Millennium Falcon, he wants to take off somewhere. But Harrison Ford is so likable, and he played it in such a likable way that it wasn't really like a, a hardcore Clint Eastwood thing or a you know a samurai movie where you wonder if the guy's ever, ever, ever gonna come off their their hardcore identity. But but that's so interesting because like there's this whole period in the 2000s, early 2010s, where all the best TV shows had kind of this bad sort of character as the main hero. So like in Mad Men, Don Draper, uh, in The Sopranos, the Tony Soprano, in in um, uh, Breaking Bad, uh, and, and on and on. There was kind of like the hardcore, hard written character in many cases. And this became like a popular theme because these guys were also likable. Yeah, in fact, let me ask you about that, because I know you've thought about this. I've never really been able to quite understand that. I mean, I love those shows. They completely sucked me in. Why do you think, why was it that these guys that are basically really bad guys become heroes that we love? What is it? Yeah, they're really bad. Um, but I, But a lot of people would say things to me like, boy, I really see myself in this character. People saw themselves in, it was like a safe way to be a bad but still charming, likable person. And without having to be bad, this is their way uh -huh. for them, people to, to live that, that life because they still want to be, these characters are still likable, just like the hard-written characters, you know, we just talked about Han Solo and slash Harrison Ford. They're likable and it's a safe way to experience the bad side. I think that's what it is. I mean, the one thing I thought, and tell me if this makes any sense to you, it's like thinking about Breaking Bad, the character in Breaking Bad that although he turns into a bad guy when he becomes the Heisenberg character, if you think of the, the opening episodes when he's at the car wash, he's, you know, being insulted by the kids in his class, you know, his wife is sort of condescending. It's like the, the he's this um, conformist, you know, middle-class, milquetoast kind of a guy. It's almost like the, the society that made him that way and that, you know, compel them to do that, that's the bad guy, you know? That's the real villain in a sense. And yeah. when you see him, Walter White, start to stand up for himself and start to get pissed off at people, you, you're you cheering him on because it's like he's breaking out of this, this conformist middle-class, you know, you know uh, world and identity. I mean, even the kids in his chemistry class, I mean, he's just trying to be a good guy and teach them something and they're just dumping all over him and they think of him, they condescend him, they think he's a total nerd and a loser. And so maybe that's, you know, I've always heard about the, like the Godfather. Why, why do we root for Michael Corleone? Why do we root for Vito Corleone? And, I, and people have said, and I believe this, that the greater society, the kind of white bread Mayflower wasp society in which the Corleone family is embedded is much worse than they are, right? They're crooked, you know, and the, the cops are crooked, the senators are crooked or so on and so forth. And they won't accept this Italian family. You know, they won't let them have, you know, a full share of the American way of life. So we kind of root for the Corleones when they take, you know, what deservedly should be theirs. Maybe that's why we're able to relate to these characters. Like we, we feel we, you know, most people are not billionaires sitting in their mansions. Most people feel like maybe the American dream didn't, they, they didn't get their share. And these people are sort of these vigilantes almost that are get, yeah, getting their, yeah. their share. Uh, it makes me think of, um, I hate to say it, I'm going to get political here. Tell but I think in a way, maybe that's part of the appeal of Trump, which, I, which I've never been able to understand on any other level, is that he is like, he's like a gangster who just takes, you know, takes what he wants and does whatever it takes to get it. And I think maybe in some way that appeals to people, you know? Yeah, and, and, and also people, maybe everybody sees Washington DC over and over again and all the politicians and we all, we, the corruption in Washington DC is like an old story. So here was a bright new story that people could say, hey, he's, we're gonna, here's our, here's our hero. Here's the arc of the hero. He got the call to action. It was almost like he played into that narrative and, and people uh, went along for, you know, some people went along for the ride. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because 
this relates to what we were talking about earlier, almost with the artist's journey, that the idea that Walter White in Breaking Bad, the bad guy is who he was when he was just trying to play along, just trying to play by all the rules and be responsible and be a good, honest person. That was almost the bad guy because he wasn't living his true life. I never thought of Breaking Bad that way, but it's really about how to live your true life, whether it's being a writer or cooking crystal meth or whatever it is. Yeah, not, I think not that, being that, a civilian, but going to war in some yeah, way. Yeah, I think that's why we rooted for him. You know that when he was, you know, when he was out there doing his thing with the, you know, the, in the camper in the middle of the desert, that uh, he was he was doing sort of what he was born to do in a way. The other thing was to also that he had tremendously high standards, right? He was a real artist in terms of cooking meth, you know? Yeah. He would deliver whatever, 90.8% or whatever, purity, whatever it was. And But the other thing, true, all the way through, James, was that he was always, he had a good side to him too, you know? He was always sort of trying to help, help his family, help uh, uh, Jesse. You know, Jesse was like this, worthless guy that was totally self-destructive would just destroy himself every but walter would kind of hang with him no matter what you know and maybe this it would be interesting to talk to was it vince gilligan was he the guy yeah. that yeah, yeah you should get him on the show it would be fascinating <laughs> to hear how he I, I would be curious if he knew at the start that this character was going to play or if it was a surprise to him i bet you he did because it reminds me of in almost all these stories we've talked about there's a moment where there's like almost practically a religious conversion where somebody moves over to the other side completely, whether it's from, you know, in Casablanca, Bogart being kind of like uh, the hard bitten, you know, club owner who finally turns out to do this righteous thing. And uh, in your book, there's an example of this, of course. And in, in all of these books, you know, Harrison Ford, Han Solo comes back to help Luke at the end of Star Wars. So there's some, there was always a conversion. And I think that's like critical to, to these journeys in, in these books. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure which Walter White's conversion was, except he came back to save Jesse at the very end. Well, uh, well, his conversion was as he started going from being kind of like this meek, mild mannered chemistry teacher to being this hardcore. Oh, uh, you mean when he became Heisenberg, when he kind of re made yeah. that switch. Yeah. You like I, I remember one of the last scenes of season one and, and the benefit of having many seasons is they were able to stretch it out. But one of the last seasons in season one was he was playing poker and everybody thought he would be bad at poker and he succeeds with this incredible bluff. And you just kind of know, I think that might have been the last scene of season one. You just kind of know, OK, he's making that uh, uh, transformation now. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. I'd love to hear what Vince Gilligan, you know, his whole how what he was thinking inside the the ballpark there, you know, inside his head. And, you know, um, in Billions, you sort of see this a little too, where the characters kind of almost switch roles. They have they, this conversion, the two main characters. So uh, in a lot of these stories where the bad becomes good or the good becomes bad. In fact, do you have in mind when you're writing what the moment of conversion is going to be? I, I definitely do. I, I definitely do. And I do, I do think that there's almost a rule I'm sure you know this rule yourself that like at the midpoint of act two, the hero chooses sides, you know, and it may be that he chooses the bad side or maybe he chooses the good side. But like uh, an example that, that I've used is a, a great scene in The Godfather. Michael is sitting in the chair and he says, uh, set up the meeting with Stolazzo and the, and the cop and, yeah. uh, and I'll kill him. You know, and before that scene, he was the clean cut guy. He was like a Marine veteran of World War II, right? Kay Adams, his wife, Diane Keaton, he was going to, was a, a non-Italian. He was going to go, he was going to be a regular American if he could. And in this scene, he chooses sides with the family. He says, I'm with the family. I don't give a shit what happens. I'm with the family now. And, and that's, you know, I, I've, I've always, I've sort of tried to do that in my own stuff as I'm outlining it or as I'm, you know, blocking in the story, I, I kind of, I'm looking for that moment. It's almost like, um, in, in some ways, you know, Chekhov's, uh, the gun. So, so yeah. Chekhov says, if there's a gun at the beginning of the story, it's gotta be fired by the end of the story. So in the beginning of the Godfather, um, Michael Corleone says to Kay, his fiance at the time, I'm not my family, Kay. 
because he describes a story and she seems shocked, which she is. And he says, but don't worry, I'm not my family. That to me, as soon as he says it in the first five minutes, that's the gun in the movie. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And it was totally deliberate on the part of, you know, the writers, you know, Francis yeah. Ford Coppola and Mario Puzo. And it absolutely worked. And I think, you know, we, you, me, everybody out there, we become so sophisticated as far as watching stories and reading books that we see that right away, you know, and it, it's kind of a, it gives you a little bit of a charge because you know, oh, I can see what's going to come out of this. You know, he's not going to be a Marine and then live in a house in Levittown, you know, he's, he's going to be part of the family. And, and then, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of more and more conversions, almost like a, a religious order where you first you're an initiate of the first circle then the second circle and the third circle. So the end of Godfather one, the last scene was when everybody's kissing the finger, Michael Carleone's finger and, uh, the door is being shut on K. So that's the final, you know, disconnection between him and his old life. Yeah. That's a, That was a great one. Great moment. Great moment. Yeah. And, you know, and then what you were saying earlier about how, you know, they're, they're kind of embedded in this wasp culture, which in many ways is no more respectable than, than they are. Al Pacino, the actor in the movie Scarface, there's this one scene towards the end where he's shouting in this restaurant at everybody, you're all just as corrupt as me. You're just hiding and I'm hiding in plain sight. You know, he kind of makes it very explicit there what, what's going on. Yeah, I think that that's that's really that's very insightful, you know, because, and that's why I think we like these bad characters, because they really are within this greater, more corrupt society. Their corruption makes some kind of sense. It's come, some kind of a statement. You know, they're bad, they're villains, but they're villains we can root for because the greater society is even more villainous. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays 
under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. I think we're we're not in a great place here, James, in terms of the wider society, you know. And no, I think I agree. We, we all know it, you know. We all know it, and we're all looking for for something. It's it's definitely scary right now, and maybe that's why, like all these shows and stories that we've just talked about, I've rewatched all of them. Casablanca, The Godfather, all the series mentioned. I've rewatched all of them during this pandemic because I think this is uh, scary times. And you know, it's interesting though how the bad guys, or at least this side of life, all seem to have a code, whether it's Humphrey Bogart or your hero in A Man in Arms or The Godfather or breaking Walter White's perfectionism with, you know, the cooking the crystal meth and his, what he, you know, how he behaves towards Jesse and his family. 
everybody seems to have a code who lives this life of their own making. And I wonder if that's also something we all wish for. We don't want to live by the code of society. Like you said in the very beginning, you had to give up the code of society in order to live the life of a writer. But the life of a writer, you had to develop your own code to have your own discipline. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that there's, you know, what Bob Dylan, what did he say? To live outside the law, you must be honest. Hmm. You know? and, uh, and I do think that most of us, anybody that's watching this podcast or that, watch, you know, there's a whole sort of uh, uh, ecosystem of podcasts and stuff that are out there. And, and I think almost all of them are honorable podcasts trying to sort of help people form their own code. You know, we're all sort of like that solitary gunslinger or whatever it is in this society, because the codes that are offered to us are so patently phony, you know? Yeah. And we're all sort of trying to find our own kind of individual code. And I think that's why these characters appeal to us so much, you know? I mean, it goes back a long time. You think about Raymond Chandler and the the hard-bitten private eyes in the 1930s, they all had their kind of, you know, a man with a code, you know, walks down these mean streets, but he himself is not mean, that kind of thing. So yeah. I think there's a great hunger out there. And anytime, you know, it's like when politicians are running for office and they make speeches, they all say the same thing. They all are trying, they're, they're saying to you, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you a free education. I'm going to give you forgiveness for your college debt. And I think we can't help but just completely see through that. It's all just bullshit. It's all just some empty promise that's never going to happen. You know, I come from an era when JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for you. I wish that somebody would ask us to sacrifice a little if it was something that we could believe in. I mean, that's why we were looking for a code, I think, because the code that's presented to us is so obviously false. Yeah, and and I think, like, I was just having this conversation with my wife, actually, which is that, you know, sometimes it's not easy to live a, a, a not a normal life. You know, we, we do many things. We do, we have to, we have to eat what we kill. So, uh, <laughs> and you can't just get the nine to five paycheck, even though that's sometimes enticing, but you saw how so many people were on, you know, laid off during this period. So it wasn't like that. It was that safe, but people are afraid. And I do think they, they're afraid to leave behind what they consider the normal life and, and find this life of living by a code and living by a set of standards and maybe doing something more what they enjoy, or, or, or even if it might be a little harder and a little riskier, I think, I think, again, that's the appeal of these stories and fiction and movies and, and books and novels because people want to safely experience that because they're not experiencing it in their, in their lives. Yeah, or, or they're trying to find, I think, and I say this of myself too, a model that they can follow, you know? If it's Clint Eastwood or if it's some character that he plays or a samurai or John Wick or whatever it is, I think people are, I know I am, I'm sort of looking for, oh, does that work? You know, the way he handled that, is that something I could do? Could I live my life like that? You know, and we're, we're all sort of seeking that, that answer, whatever it may be. Yeah. Like, did you ever watch a James Bond movie and then you leave a movie feeling like you're James Bond? <laughs> I don't know. I never really bought into James Bond, but I mean, but you've certainly done that in your life, James. I mean, you've really carved out, you know, I mean, you've invented yourself, you know, there was no James Altucher before there was you, you know, um, and, and you've created this sort of unique thing, you know, this persona and this industry, you know, this creative, evolving artist, businessman type of person. And uh, I'm curious, was there a moment for you when you kind of uh, sort of chose to be kind of the outlaw that you are? Yeah, I guess I got after many, many years of being miserable and just trying for the pursuit of money, I got really a hundred percent sick of it all. I got sick of all the people. I got sick of just so much, you know, just, I don't want to say criminal activity, but I mean, I wasn't doing anything, but there was, there's like wall street in general is just like an ugly place. And I really just always wanted to 
do what I wanted to do, which was right. And there was no reason why I couldn't do that. And then on the side, do stuff, do business stuff while the writing catches up rather than the other way around. Cause I was just being miserable and I didn't want to, I was 40 years old. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life completely miserable for the next 20 years and then only have, you know, whatever, 20 years to, you know, live, live the life I wanted. I mean, was there a moment, I'm going to ask you sort of a Brian Koppelman like question. Was there a moment like where you like left a job, a specific moment in time or a decision, or was it a series of smaller decisions? I would say it was, it was a series of worse and worse decisions, kind of like a spiraling towards bottom. But then there was a moment where I was day trading and I'd always been a good day trader. And just this one day I lost a lot of money and I was like, what am I doing? Like literally I was disgusted with myself, like just trying to make a few dollars doing whatever in the markets. And then literally I got up and went to the river and just like, it, almost like I was oh, like dear. baptizing myself. Like, uh, <laughs> like, like I, I went swimming in the river. And then after that, I, I started, I was already writing financial articles and, and, and for the prior 10 years, but then I started writing these more, much more personal ones, like right after that. And that's really what, what changed the whole trajectory of my career. So was there, it's, it, there was definitely, it seems to me there was a moral dimension to that, correct? That decision? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the fact that nobody was honest. So like you watch CNBC, for instance, and everyone's like, oh, Tesla is a good stock or Google's good. They are saying this because they own it. So they want other people to own it. No one's really being honest about what's going on and what they think. Everybody has an agenda of layers, so many layers of agenda. They don't even know that they're lying. Uh -huh. And, and yeah. I got just seeing through that. I just got like, I remember one time I was watching a news show and the producer comes up to me and because I was watching it behind the scenes and, and this news producer comes up to me and says, we're just trying to fill up the space between advertising and just on every layer, it's just all about money and there's nothing wrong with it. That's how society works. It's just, I, I couldn't stand it. And it made everyone into these superficial liars and I didn't, and, and so I started writing about times I failed instead of times I've succeeded. And everybody was saying like, are you, did, did you have a brain tumor? Like, are, are you about to die? Like, what's, are you going to commit suicide? What's going, what's going on? And I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just being honest. I'm just telling the story of what happened to me. And they're like, well, maybe you shouldn't do that because you're not going to be able to, no one's going to want to do business with you. And I'll tell you more people have wanted to do business with me since then, than than way more than ever before. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, it's like you you would want to deal with, I don't know, Donald Draper in a business probably. He's a smart guy. You know, he's the main star of Mad Men. Or you would open up a club with Humphrey Bogart, perhaps, <laughs> you know, like Casablanca. That's always one of my favorites. So, uh, but yeah, it's, a, it, it's an interesting thing. I think there is always some moment of conversion along the way where you have to find your own code or you're going to sink. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you like a small, ver a, a small version of this for me where I had, but I've, I've had a million of these moments, but I was working in, uh, in Hollywood and I was out at some studio. I don't know where the hell it was. I was walking down this hallway long coming out of a meeting. And I saw this, this woman, this, you know, the executive, like way at the end of the hallway. And she looked great from like a long distance away. And I thought, ah, I, I can't wait to get closer and really see what she, she's, what she's like, you know? And she was in conversation with some other person, you know, and as I got closer and closer, she looked better and better and better. And then I, I heard her say to this, to the other executive, she said, I've got to get you with me on the three stooges. And this was a movie that they were making. Right. And my heart just totally sank. And I sort of realized that just a lot like you, James, that sort of the ethic of every person in every office in that studio was we want to hit we don't give a shit what it is. We don't care how bad it is, how much it you know debases the culture, how stupid it is, how lame it is. We just want to hit, you know? And I said to myself, that is not the business I'm in. I'm not here to do that. And I had a real crisis at that point because I thought, this is the business, you know? This is the business I'm in. And this is the, the rule. These are the rules they play by. And how am I going to do that if I'm going to try to write what I want to write? And it, I had a real crisis there for a while. It must be exactly true in Washington. If you're, imagine if you're at the Trump White House or if you're even any, anywhere, 
in, in, the, in the Senate or the Congress or something. And you see that everybody is just an opportunist and they're just looking out for the main chance, whatever it is. And you came to Washington because you wanted to make a difference. You wanted to help somebody. You know, you're going to have a moral crisis again. What, how can I stay in this cesspool? You know, what am I going to do? Unfortunately, that's the society we live in. Yeah, I don't know how to change that part because even look at like, let's say you're a young congressman, you just got in. Now you have to get, in order to have any sort of voice, you have to get on the right committees. Right. But in order to get on the right committees, you have to play with the the leadership. You have to vote the direction that they say, tell you to vote. And so you you have to be w going in there. You have to be willing to make that sacrifice or you're only going to have a two-year career there. Yeah. And I think that's why you see people leave Congress or leave the Senate. I mean, very few leave the Senate because I guess the perks are just too great. But, you know, they just, they realize, I just can't do this. I can't make a difference. I, you know, I'd rather go home and try to, you know, help out somehow, some other way. But I'll tell you, like, one of the things I'm just thinking of this now as we're talking, you know, my, my novels are mostly historical fiction, as you said, set back usually in the ancient world, Rome or Greece or whatever. And if you think about our society today, a consumer society. I mean, that's what it is, right? Yeah. It's based on products. It's based on selling. It's based on consuming. And if you think, I think, I mean, I hate that society. I hate the whole concept of it. I think it's, you know, however prosperous it's all made us, it's, you know, destroying us on every other level. And so I think not that those ancient societies were any better, but they never thought about it. It was, there, it was really sort of a, a society of, warfare or conquest or competition between, you know, one prince and another, you know, but at least there was an ethic to it, you know, it wasn't yeah. just how many potato chips can we sell or how many cases of preparation H or whatever we can do on Wall Street, you know, to scam some more money out of some other suckers, you know? It's, it's like somebody was telling me the other day, uh, they think there might be a civil war coming in the U.S. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So Americans are just too lazy right now. Or you can't interrupt our TV watching every night. Like that's it, there's not civil war can't interrupt that. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see a civil war like we used to have, but it'll be something else. You know. You know, you've never written a political novel. Have you considered that? No, I've never. I've never thought about that. But I, I like those things. I'm. I. I you know, I, I don't have the expertise. I haven't lived that world. You know. But you haven't lived in 55 AD either. That's true too. But I guess I, guess I have to take that back. But uh, you know, I'm I'm my career has, has suffered from me not sticking in one genre. You know, switching genres too much. No, but why do you think? It, oh, so that's interesting. Like I doubt anybody else would say that about you. But it's interesting our own opinions of ourselves. Like, why do you think? In what way has your career suffered? I mean. For instance, you switching genres to the uh, Legend of Bagger Vance led to a, a, a huge movie. Uh, yeah, that was sort of a, a you know its own one of a kind deal. But I mean, I did do like five novels set in the ancient world that were kind of military themed stuff, Sparta, Athens, that kind of thing. Which A Man at Arms is now my return to that after thirteen years away. But at, at that point, I sort of thought, you know, I could become a brand in this area if I wanted to. I could just kind of keep doing this. And again, I thought, I don't want to do that. You know, that's, uh, you know, I, I can do better than that. And so I started, you know, doing more contemporary stuff and things like that. But I think that doesn't help you as a career because people sort of liked you doing the one thing you were doing. And now they see, oh, there's this new book and it's completely different. I don't know if I want to read that new book, you know? I know what you mean, but look at like Bob Dylan's memoirs. He discusses this. Because in the 60s is where he wrote all the songs we remember him by, or at least I remember him by. But then in the 80s, his producers were trying to get him to do, I don't know, rap songs or whatever. And he kept going more and more in the direction that he had started going in the 60s. And nobody liked it at all. But he just had to do it. Like, that's what he had to do. And I guess he, he made enough money from his songs in the 60s. He didn't, you know, because it always is intermixed. He didn't think about it. But he just kept do doing his own like as you're doing, you're his own true stories he had to tell. He couldn't switch just for the producers or for the or for the crowd. Yeah, you know, which is why for your your you know when I write kind of um, these memoirish type books, which are you know about failure or or success or whatever, there's only so many times I could write 
the same type of story, but you, you think to yourself, oh, the audience likes this, but you can't, as you have said, you can't let the audience dictate. Like, how do you avoid actually the, the I'm asking as advice now, like how do you avoid the audience dictating what you should write? Because you know, they like th this style in the past. Well, I do have an answer for that, Jim. So I'll give it to you. I think we've talked about this before. And um, I'm definitely a believer in the muse. I believe that there's a force, you know, on another dimension of reality that, or in our deep unconscious, um, that is that is guiding us, you know. And um, and my, I'm a servant of my own muse, whatever. And I so I sort of ask her, you know, what's the next thing? What's the next book that you want me to do? And, and rather than asking, what do I think is going to sell? Because every time I try to do that, I'm always wrong, you know. Um, and so I'm, uh, you know, I think if you look at Bob Dylan's albums over time, you can really see that they're really in the same vein. I mean, he kind of goes a little bit up and a little bit down, a little bit sideways, but it's basically, you know, kind of, it's all a very similar trajectory. And he, I'd love to hear him talk about this, you know, because I'm sure that he feels like what he's doing now is an evolution beyond subterranean homesick blues and blonde on blonde and all those kind of things. But he's kind of following his star and his muse, and that's that's what I do too. And it's it's it sometimes takes me out of a genre that people might expect me to be in. But that's if I can keep doing that to the end, I'm happy. Yeah, and and you know you you change genres, but again, it's so interesting to see how you use what you write about. You know when you're when you take these traditional types of stories, but then mix them in with your own imagination, your own research on history and so on. And, you know, map it to a new novel. Like, I think, I think that's almost like one genre. Like there's the Stephen Pressfield genre of, you know, taking these classic motifs and combining them in interesting ways to make these very easy to read page turning books. I really enjoyed this a man in arms. It's a unique combination that happens at the end, I would say, without without giving it away. Yeah, but yeah, I was hoping for that. I know it's very tough to talk about fiction in a podcast or something when when the, our listeners haven't read it and don't know what it is, you know? And you can't really talk about the I've never figured out how to do that. You can't talk about the characters because nobody knows who the characters are. It'd be like talking about Breaking Bad if nobody had seen Breaking Bad, you know? Yeah, even some of the issues you bring up, I don't know whether to bring them up. I mean, there's some very important like religious issues you bring up, uh, which relates to the entire history of Christianity, which I want to be able to talk about, but we can save it for for another time. But it was it was it was interesting in a lot of levels in Roman history, Christian history, and just the idea of this man having a man at arms, the title of the book, this man having this kind of code to live by. Like, do you see yourself as having a code now? Like, what are the items in your code? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I, I definitely do see myself as having a code. It's kind of a fuzzy code. I'm not really sure exactly what it is, but it's something like what I just talked to you about uh, being a servant of the muse. And then I really try to feel like, and this pandemic time has been a, a really interesting time for me because, and a real challenging time, particularly the politics and what's going on in the country that are, uh, are tremendously upsetting to me. I mean, I'm, I'm really, you know, on the soul level, I'm really being kind of torn apart by what's happening in the country right now. And I'm very disillusioned with, you know, my dream of what America was, you know, but my sort of code to such an extent is that I have a destiny. I have a, a calling that I'm following. And to some extent, I have to block out the stuff that's going on out there and not and not get carried away by it or get sucked into it unless and until it's a moment when you absolutely have to, you know, when it's do or die. And so first thing in the morning, I'm out doing some kind of exercise or something, some physical stuff, working out or something like that as a way of keeping myself focused and keeping myself positive and keeping myself going forward following my own muse and my own star and figuring and hoping that that's contributing somehow, hoping that the books I write or whatever I put out there um, is helping people one way or another. But um, 
So, you know, like what we were talking before about not having a family and that there are certain things that I've given up, you know, um, I'm not going to have that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to participate in that, but I am going to be able to participate in this thing over here. I'm trying to be a good warrior in that, in that world, you know? So I am kind of like the, the character in the man at arms, the Telemann character who's very self-sufficient and kind of knows kind of, I always admire those samurai characters in samurai movies that uh, kind of know where they're going and have a code and just stay with it. And, you know, because of that, they become very likable. They become like magnets. Everybody wants to be around them, talk to them, learn from them. Like the character, wherever he goes, he sort of stands out because of this code, I think. I think, I mean, it's true in real life. Whenever you meet somebody that, that's like that, you're drawn to them, you know, because most of us are, you know, we have so much freedom. I mean, every minute of our lives, we can go one way or another. And, and, and we have so much freedom that we're kind of lost. And I think particularly a, a lot of young people are. Certainly I was, you know, up until I was probably 50 years old, you know. I, you know, I just, uh, if you'd asked me one, one day to the next what I believed in, it would be different, you know. And one time I was trying Zen, I was trying to achieve enlightenment, you know. Another time, you know, I was traveling around, the, whatever, you know. And anytime I would encounter somebody that really knew who they were, and really had a cause, really had a calling, that and, and a true call, not just a bullshit calling that they were putting out there. I, I was drawn to them. And I think that's why those Clint Eastwood type, those gunslinger characters, that kind of person, even a Walter White, you know, once he started going that way, or a Tony Soprano, I mean, you or Don Draper, in a way you have to you have to admire them, you know. I, I do think that we as a society, American society, I'm probably getting too deep and into kind of bullshit here, but I think this is true, James, that like in, I'm going to try to make a complicated thought here. In my dad's era, my dad grew up in the Depression, World War II, that kind of thing. And what he always wanted for me when I went to college, he wanted, I, I went to college as an engineer. And he wanted me to, you know, be an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, whatever the hell it was, because he thought... You know, you'll work for IBM or you'll work for some company and you'll have security. And that was tremendously important, not just to my dad, but I think to everybody in that generation. And of course, as soon as I got to college, I switched to English. You know, I broke my father's heart. He thought I was insane, you know. But I think what has been presented to us as a society is fit in in a place, go to work for this company, put in your time, get your pension, whatever it is. And that has completely fallen apart. That world no longer exists, you know? So each of us, like you, me, so many people are trying to carve out their own niche, right? You know, who am I? Why was I what was I put here for? What do I love to do? What can I do, right? You did it, you know, when you had your moment, you know, you jumped in the river or whatever. And that movement, it's kind of a silent movement. It's below the radar, but it's going on in tens of millions of people now, unfortunately, a lot of them are getting sucked into, you know, Instagram and, you know, how many followers do I have and what bullshit can I put out, you know? But I do think a lot of people are really trying to create themselves, you know, find out who they really are and somehow make a go of it. Now, I don't know if that can work in our phony baloney consumer society, but I think that's a lot of the turmoil is being caused by people being lost in that way, you know, and latching on to some cult-like scenario that's out there. I, I, I think everybody wants to outsource their kind of health and self-esteem and financial health to, to somebody else, whether it's a, a, a financial institution or a political party or a political person or a boss. Everybody wants to outsource the things that are important to them instead of taking responsibility for it. And I don't say this in a bad way because I think people are legitimately scared. It's a very confusing world, but I do think it is possible. It's just what people don't realize is, is that it's hard. Like how often, and maybe you never are, but how often are you disappointed in yourself? Not just with the writing, but just in general. I mean, I'm always disappointed in myself, you know, <laughs> except on when I have a, ra a rare good day. But I think that's yeah. just, li that's life, you know? I mean, like where I live, you know, you've been here, there's a big canyon below me and there's a lot of hawks that fly around hunting there. 
And I'm sure they have a lot of disappointing days, you know, they're yeah. flying around all day looking for a little mouse or something that they can get. And I think that's just, that's the nature of, of life. Small business owners are savvy and know how to get maximum value from their monthly business purchases. The Enhanced American Express Business Gold Card is designed to take your business further. It is packed with benefits and features like four times membership rewards points that automatically adapt to your top two eligible spending categories every month on up to $150,000 in purchases per year. So you earn more where your businesses spend the most plus up to $395 in annual statement credits on eligible business purchases at select shipping, food delivery, and retail subscription merchants. So with flexible spending capacity that adapts to your business and access to 24-7 support from a business card specialist, you can continue to run your business with confidence. The Amex Business Gold Card, now smarter and more flexible. It's got the powerful backing of American Express. Enrollment required, terms apply. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash businessgoldcard. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. You can crush your fingers and all your toes during a data center migration. You can knock on wood, pluck a dozen four-leaf clovers, or look to your lucky stars for a successful office expansion. You could hold your breath, shut your eyes, and say all the world wishes to help avoid cyber attacks. But none of that truly helps you. Because Next Level Moments need the Next Level Network. With the security, reliability, and expertise to take your business further. AT&T Business, the network you can rely on. Everybody thinks like, oh, it's great. This person's a professional skier. I would love it if I was a professional skier. Well, whoever is the professional skier has probably broken their legs several times or broken arms or failed and came in second by half a second in some really important race and so didn't become world famous and became an also ran. Like there's so much disappointment when you throw everything on the line that I think that's a big hurdle. That's part of the resistance that you always write about. That's a big hurdle that the the non-conformist has to jump through and it, it's not easy no and you know it's i wish somebody would do kind of a movie about what i'm about to talk to you about i'm just reading a story about this female marathon runner i can't remember i just read it in the paper like a few days ago who had she, i think she just turned 40 or something she's a single mom or something i had a teacher and uh 
And she had never made the Olympic team. She had never kind of broken through to that level where you could say, you know, she's made it. And, but, but she and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people live in that world just below the level of, of fame, you know, but they're amazing runners, right? And they sacrifice and they, you know, whatever they do to, to keep their lives together. And what happened with this woman was somehow she like knocked 20 minutes off her marathon time in one year, like some unheard of thing. Um, and so she finally kind of crossed the line and got in there. But my hat's off to all the people that are out there that are just below that line of, of fame, you know, but that are living that life, that are dedicated to it, and that they're, and when you meet them, they're absolutely great at what they do. You know, the level that they're at is amazing. And the sacrifices that they're putting in, and in many ways, that's that's real life. That's the real life for somebody that's that's really committed to a calling. Because only the top few, only Lindsey Vaughn and a few other people are really going to make any money as skiing, you know, or, or anything, anything at all, right? But there is a world below that where you can live that life and, and at least keep body and soul together one way or another. And yeah. God bless everybody that's doing that. I consider myself in that level. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, we'll take writing, writing or even almost any field. Like, take tennis. In tennis, the top 10 or the top 20, let's say the top 10 make real wealth. The top 10 in, on the planet. Out of the 2 billion people who play tennis, yeah. the top 10 make wealth. The top 20 probably make a great, great living. Like, you know, what, what anybody would consider a great living. The top 200 can probably make a living. Like, you know, as a coach or in some sort of, you know, have a tennis shop or whatever. I don't know. Maybe the top thousand could make enough to live on. And then after that, the, ne the next billion people can't make a living playing tennis. You could be thousand one in the world on the planet at tennis, and you're just not going to make enough to live on. And I think it's the same thing with, with writing. Like you could only, if, you're only going to make a living writing novels if you're, let's say in the top two, 300 or, or novels or any books. Uh, and then after that, you have to, you know, and this, this really in includes most people, including most great, great, fantastic writers. You have to do other things like podcasts or coaching or writing other ghost writing or who knows yeah, what else in college. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's a great thing that Elizabeth Gilbert said, I know, you know, this one where she sort of made a deal at the start of her career, made a deal with her own writing where she kind of said, I'm never going to ask you to support me. I will support you. Hmm. And I think that's a, like a great way of, of looking at it because um, one can live the writer's life or the athlete's life or the whatever it is, if you can just support it some other way. And it can be done. It can be done. Just like having a, you know, a martial arts practice or a yoga practice. That's when it sort of, for me, when the life that you and I live becomes a practice. We were talking about that earlier. You were talking about Seth Godin's book, The Practice, you know, yeah. where you're just going to do it no matter what, just because you love it, you know? If it doesn't, if it doesn't bring in money, you know, too bad. You know, if it does, that's great. But you're going to do it anyway, just because it brings you joy. You know, it's what you were put here to do. Because you're right, only the top, top few are going to actually make a living. And they're probably miserable. You know, they're probably sucked in and so much stuff with assistants and, you know, agents and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you look, you look at the world of stand-up comedy, for instance, it's clearly the top 10 make a living. 10 through tw uh, the top 10 make wealth 10 through 20 make a great living. And then it goes on straight down. And, and some of these people who are not making even a living at it are the funniest people in the world. Like they're funnier than the people at the top, in my opinion, I mean, it's subjective, but it's, you know, sometimes also you can't criticize yourself if you're not selling a hundred million copies of your books. I mean, some things are just, there's a luck factor. There's a, you know, hitting the, the right place at the right time factor and all, all these other factors that are out of the control of the, the creative or, or the person who's working hard for something. There's some things that are a little bit out of control, but it doesn't mean it's any less worth it. Yeah. I mean, most of it's out of control. I'd say like 98% of it. Again, you, you sort of realize that, that 
like you say, there's so many comics that are great comics, right? You hear them, you go, how come this person isn't, you know, on top of the world, you know? And it's the same thing with, uh, I remember going to a, a, an off-Broadway show a few years ago and there was this actor and the guy was just incandescent, you know? I mean, he was, you know, you just, you didn't know what to do beside yourself watching this guy, how great he was. And I finally, I saw him in like one movie and he was, you know, he finally sort of got on the big stage and he was like, you know, the, the uh, third colonel from the left in the, uh, in the war room who said, you know, but sir, we shouldn't do that. I know, oh, no, the poor, the guy's so great, you know. So it, it, is, it is true that we, we have to find some way to make it a practice or to live on a level that's a, below that level of ultimate, you know, fame and paying for it, you know. How do you know, though, if what you're doing is the thing that is your practice as opposed to, okay, well, I've done this for X number of years. Now I'm going to, now I'm interested in something else. I'm going to switch to that. Like you, you've really, you, you know, you know, you can live through the disappointments, the ups and downs of a writing career, but some people might say, oh, I just didn't get four books in a row published. It's time for me to become a carpenter or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to switch to something else at any moment, you know, if it, if it seems like the right thing to do. But it is hard to know. I mean, my only answer to that is, does it feed you, you know, just yeah. the work itself? You know, at the end of the day, do, are, you, are you at peace with yourself, you know, when you've had a good day of something? And, and if not, then maybe it's the wrong thing. But yeah, that's very true. I remember um, my my last actual nine to five job. I remember I was so kind of depressed. I couldn't wake up in the morning. That's always a sign for me now that that something needs to change. I might not always know what it is, but a change is happening. And almost like your service to the muse, I, I do service to whatever change it is that's going to happen. Because I don't know yet what the change is going to be. How how do you know, James? What what what? Uh, how do you know? I know because. I mean, and and maybe maybe it's too much to say I fully know, but I usually know when, like, my chest feels on fire with some new activity. Like, there was one year I was planning on doing a significant amount of writing, and I in February of that year I got up on stage to perform stand-up comedy, and over the next six years I probably performed maybe twelve hundred or so more times after that because I just loved it. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, now with the, um, with this economic lockdown, it, it got me back to my original love of, of writing. And I was able to do a lot of work this way because you couldn't travel around and perform. So, you know, and then I went, I was on fire again with, with a revitalized love for, for writing. Ah, uh, but it's this feeling in the chest almost. My, my, I take my hat off more than any other occupation to comics. The idea of like getting up on stage and trying to make people laugh is just the most daunting thing I could think about. So I just want to ask you, when you say you loved it, what is, what is it? What's the rush? The rush is, and this doesn't, doesn't really happen. I mean, it happens in a somewhat in the beginning, but it becomes as with anything that's worth doing, even, you know, like writing as an example, it becomes more nuanced. But when you, make people laugh with idea, unique ideas and performance that you have. Cause it's not just the joke. It's how you're acting on stage. It's how you're acting yeah. with the crowd and to viscerally make them laugh is like a huge accomplishment. It like feels really good. And it's, and the stimulus is right away, as opposed to you write a book and then a year later it's published and you're on, you're already on to the next book. Then with, with comedy, there's something also addictive about having the feedback, the rush, instantaneously. So there's maybe a negative aspect of that, the addictive quality, but, but also you re there's a certain, um, once you, once you, you, once I realized how hard it was that it wasn't just telling jokes, it was like, you have to be likable. You have to play with the crowd. You have to improvise. You have to be fun. You have to do, be kind of goofy on stage or play a persona and you have to say something in an honest way. You can't just like act out yeah, you know, yeah. your, your jokes. Once I realized how hard it was, just the skill acquisition part. Like I was watching videos all day. I was performing every night and I just was really wanting to get good at it. So there was this, there was nothing else I wanted to get good at more than, than this. Ah, 
Yeah, I, 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 as you said, I guess I can. I mean, I just as a regular person, I love it when I can make just one person laugh. So because there's something that's so pure about a laugh and it's it's so hard too. because, you know, there is, you know, they, they come to a club because they want to laugh. But as you get up on stage, you know, they're resisting you, right? They're saying, who yes. is this character? Is he, you know, the schmuck? What is he, you know? And, but if you can make them laugh, because it's involuntary, right? You know, you, they, yeah. and that's, a, that's, you know, I think it's more probably than being, you know, uh, a, uh, you know uh, a lover or a sexy sort of thing that can make somebody laugh. It's the only thing better I ever think would be if they started showering you with money, you know, because that would be like something else nobody wants to do. But when they give up a laugh, and I would imagine, and then once you kind of get them going, a crowd, I would imagine, and they really start to love you and they think you're hysterical, that must be a great feeling. Oh, yeah. Once once you're what's called in the pocket, then it's there. you control the room. You control their laughter on and off. It's like you're modulating it. And... uh uh, it is a it is a great feeling, although I had an experience recently where same club, two shows, two different nights, um, one after the other, Thursday and a Friday, and or a Friday and a Saturday, and the Friday night I had them all laughing, and the Saturday night was the worst show I ever had in six years. Six years was by far the worst show I had ever had, and I, and it's those kinds of things happen like the, the, With the night same before material. Was, same material and the same wow. town, so almost the same kind of audience, you would think. Wow. But uh, uh, there was something I had done just probably, a, like if I watched, I should go back and watch the videos now, but it was fairly recently. Uh, I should, There's probably some subtle difference in what I did that made me, I mean, I hadn't been really truly heckled since the first year I had done comedy until this moment. <laughs> And it was, <laughs> and it wasn't even, it wasn't like devastating, which I thought it would be after, after so long of not having that experience. But, uh, I was more like just curiosity, like what the heck happened? And then they were so <laughs> mad at me. One person even wrote an email to me the next day saying, man, I just want to tell you again, you sucked. And <laughs> I never had that happen before, oh, and wow. it's, but it was, but now it's a story. So everything, everything is if you lean into any difficulty in what you love doing, it becomes material. So yeah, that's true. That's true. You made me laugh right now. Yeah. It, it was funny, you know, and, and also what's a, a good too, and this I'm, I, I'm sure you experience in writing. Like I love this about writing is when you start to get good at a skill and you appreciate that two writers are very different in ways that you now understand, which you might not have understood before, you know, like, so you might be very different than, or let's let's take two classic examples. Like Hemingway might be very different than Fitzgerald, but when I was a kid studying them both in high school, I might not have really noticed all the differences. And now you're like, oh my gosh, the Grand Canyon separates them, and it's all beautiful in between. Yeah, and that is the great thing that just like there's room for every kind of comedian, there's room for every kind of book on the bookshelf. You know, and anybody that's listening to, to us right now, that's writing something. I mean, there's room for that book on the bookshelf, you know? Absolutely. Like, uh, I mean, there are great short story writers who have no, who are, aren't really plot driven, but are maybe among the most beautiful writers ever. Then there are extreme plot people like John Grisham, or I guess Danielle Steele or whoever, and you could love them. And then there's, you know, historical novelists and, and novelists like you and a bunch of different genres that are, uh, you know, great at what you do and, and, and on and on and on. It just goes on. There's a huge yeah. spectrum. How did, how did you come to podcasting James? It was this, so it's almost actually, so today is the seventh year anniversary of me podcasting. I started in January, 2014. The yes. So the, the, basically the first Monday after new year's was the first day I released wow. a podcast in 2014. And I really anybody just wanted been doing podcasts in those days. Yeah, I mean, like Joe Rogan was and uh -huh. Adam Carolla. There, there uh -huh. were a few, but not a lot. And basically, I wanted an excuse to call all my favorite people like you, Steve, uh -huh. and uh, be able to ask them questions. Because normally, you can't do that. Normally, I can't call Steve Pressfield and say, hey, I have a few questions about your absolute <laughs> latest book. Can you talk to me about it? Uh -huh. And not only that, I got to read your book in advance. Uh -huh. so, to relate it to what you said earlier, I think a lot of people get into podcasting as a means to something else, 
like, you know, more followers or maybe a better speaking career or, uh, or and I don't think, I, I don't think you could have a good podcast if you do it that way. You have to be unique. Yeah. You just have to be interested in the people you have on the show, right? And just trying to pull out of them, whatever it is you're trying to get out of them. Like, let me ask you a question. Like you've been on a lot of podcasts now. How many people have read the book? <laughs> What was the question? How many people have read the book? How, how many podcasters have read your book? Uh, actually, you're the first podcast that I've been on that uh, that's on the, it all on the subject of a man in arms. Oh, I hope I hope they all read the book then. Yeah, so, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> usually, guests tell me that the pot, a lot of the podcasters don't read, or they have an assistant kind of summarize the book, and then I just wonder, what are you? What happens? Yeah. Yeah. What's your? Why are you doing a podcast? Or let me ask you this about writing: Do you ever ask yourself? what am I contributing to the world of writing to the world beyond with this book? Am I contributing something unique? Uh, I do. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody does, right? What do you do if you're doing a comedy routine or something like that? Right. You have to, I mean, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'm doing something that people haven't seen before. And that will be that if nothing else, that will entertain them for the time you know, and, and when they're done, they'll put it down and they'll say, that was a damn good book. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to bring a little joy into people's lives. Like, what would you say? I don't know if you could answer this in a way that doesn't give away spoilers, but what would you say is the unique thing you contributed in A Man at Arms? I mean, I could think of a couple, but your knowledge of historical novels is, is more vast than, than mine. Well, I think, okay, it's a great question. Um, I really feel that this book is 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 meant for the moment right now, you know that it's a it may be said in the past, but it's a it's a contemporary thing. And I think that the that the character, the the lead character, tell him on the the uh, solitary mercenary gunslinger of the ancient world, is like you or me. Is he has a code, but the code is not completely working, you know, and. And the world around him is a pretty screwed up world, you know, and he's asked to make certain moral choices that he's that uh, he thought he would be comfortable with, but he's not comfortable with. And he does make a choice. And I think that the choice, you know, you said there's religious elements to this story and there are obviously. Um, and and because I do think whenever we make a choice, like when you your moment by the river. It's a, it's a moral. It almost sounds corny, by the way, saying by the river, like I, uh, a forced I like that, baptism. It's, 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 the part of the, it's the actual story, so I have to say it that way. But sorry, go ahead. But that's classic. I went down to the river, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, and, and, uh, and so he has to make a, mo a moral choice. And I think we're all kind of at that, at that place now. And the moral choice that he makes is, a, is that a, on a very high level, you know, it's not just, oh, I'm going to help this person, you know, and it's, it's a, it's a whole sort of change your heart, change your soul kind of level, which does become religious, does become spiritual. And I think that that's what, uh, what we all are sort of groping for right now, although we might not know it and nobody's actually saying it. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's really true. Like because of the lockdown, again, 55 million people at some point or other during this period filed for unemployment insurance. That that's that's almost half out of 120 million workers and everybody sort of has to take a step back and say, okay, I have there's a fork in the road here for better or for worse. What what do I do now? And I think they are people are looking for these these answers, these choices, these codes. And I think you're you're right that I didn't think of it this way, but you're right. This book is about today's time right now. Yeah, and un unfortunately, there are people out there who are not such good people that are offering choices. You know, maybe in their mind they think they're honorable, but they're offering choices to people that are not such great choices. And that's what uh, that's another part of this problem that we're in right now. But you're right. I think we're having to rethink this whole society that we live in. If if you're right, if 55 million people applied for unemployment. What does that mean? You know. Can we keep, is this sustainable? Can we keep doing this? Yeah, I don't, I don't know because, you know, you mentioned earlier we're in a consumer society, but we haven't been consuming as much because there hasn't been a need. We haven't gone out. Yeah. And so that's going to change things as well. 
I'll be very interested to see what happens when this is over, if it's ever over. You know, are we just going to go flooding back to consuming like madmen? Or are we going to kind of realize that maybe we haven't needed so much stuff? Yeah, I think that's what's what's happening. And particularly, too, the places are closing. Like in, in New York City, perhaps some huge amount, I won't even say a percentage, some huge amount of restaurants are going to be out of business. The places that you would go to every day for decades are just gone now. And people might say, okay, well, now I have choices again instead of a routine. Yeah, I, well, I sure hope they open up. I'm a big restaurant person myself. I love to go out to breakfast, go out to dinner. And yeah. I have a feeling when there's demand, you know, places are going to reopen one way or another. I, I hope you're right. Well, what, what are you working on right now now that this is uh, done? <laughs> We're going to talk about this. this. This is another thing that sort of led to me by, actually by my girlfriend, Diana, that you just met before we went on the thing. It's a uh, love story. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've, I've always stayed away from writing about my real life, you know, other than the knowledge, the taxi yeah. cab book. And, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm tackling something like that, you know, sort of, uh, if anybody were to say to me, oh, you know, I've read the war of art, I've read your other stuff. And I, and, uh, but I wonder what really happened? How did you, how did you actually get there? You know, what was the process? And so I'm trying to figure out some way to, to tell sort of some real life stories. Yeah, that would be so enormous because it would be, it would be kind of halfway between your two genres of the, the war of art genre and the um, historical novel genre where you're taking your storytelling and applying it directly in some logical order to the sequence of events that led up to now, I think would be, would be fascinating. I, I, I know because you've told me some of the stories and I've never seen them in any of the five, six, seven books you have that are in that genre that you have many of these stories to tell, or like the story you just told about the, the woman who was talking about the three stooges movie. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be in this book too. But yeah, you know, thanks James. Cause I hadn't uh, even thought of it that way before as being kind of between one and the other, you know, which that helps me as a way of uh, conceptualizing it. And, you know, look at um, Bukowski, like his novels, like Post Office and Hollywood and Factotum. These were, they really almost shouldn't have been called novels, but they were written and structured like a novel and he changed the name of the main character, but it was, it was himself. He simply called it a novel and it works. But then when he actually tried to write pure fiction, it didn't work. He kind of had to write autobiography rather than ah. fiction, but his autobiography worked as fiction. Ah, that's interesting. Cause I, it's sort of the opposite for me. Like what, what has, when I tried to write my true stories, it never worked. And only when I sort of decide I'm making this shit up out of thin air, did that sort of work for me. So, but the knowledge worked. I loved reading the knowledge. Ah, you're one of like 24 people. I think that read that book, James. <laughs> Uh, maybe I wonder, I mean, again, I had no problem with the knowledge if you just kept doing that. Uh, but like you said, you have a lot of stories, maybe view it as like a collection of vignettes, but then lace it together like a novel. I, I think that's sort of what I'm, uh, it's evolving into. And here's an interesting thing for whatever this is worth or any of our listeners that are writers is I've been working on this now for, you know, I don't know, maybe six months or something. And I'm still in a tremendous state of self-doubt. You know, I don't really, if it wasn't for Diana kind of cracking the whip over me, I, you know, I would have bailed on this thing. In other words, it's, I interpret that to be resistance, capital R resistance, yeah. the self-doubt. But I've got, uh, so I would encourage anybody that's listening, that's working on a project and they've got a lot of self-doubt to stick with it, you know, that that doubt can be a form of resistance because I'm finally starting to get some traction on this, but it's been, it's been pretty hard in terms of believing in it. Oh my God. I am so looking forward to this now. Like, but I would still continue, keep in your mind, like the storytelling approach, like start off each vignette with like the most intense part of, or the most in, you know, what does the main character want? What do you want out of that <laughs> vignette? Like the, when, when you're, when you're in that scene at the Hollywood studio, you want to make a movie and you're torn because they want to make, you know, a remake of the three stooges. <laughs> 
Like well, I'm gonna have to re-listen to this podcast, James, for inspiration. That, that and meanwhile, it. you're looking for like there, there's the beautiful woman. Like you've got <laughs> all the elements there of uh, the arc of the hero, right? In uh -huh. that one vignette. Who, who's who's a kind of realistic writer that that like a Bukowski type of guy or Celine or who who writes kind of autobiographical fiction that you like? Mm, that's a good question. A movable feast is a little like that. Yeah, I would say that Henry Miller's stuff, you know, Tropic yeah. of Capricorn and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you ever read uh, Dennis Johnson's book of short stories, Jesus Son? No. In fact, oh. I haven't even heard of it. Huh. Oh, my God. It's a beautiful collection of short stories. I will send it to you and huh. you'll I'll see. Thank you. So, but anyway, Stephen, it's been such a pleasure once again talking to you about your latest book, A Man at Arms. Uh, this is, I encourage everyone to read it. It was a page turner. It's actually first novel I've read in, in a few months. I've been reading mostly nonfiction lately and such a, such a pleasant return to fiction for me. And by the way, people should read all of your other books, but this is the latest one, A Man at Arms and set in 55 AD, Han Solo or Humphrey Bogart or Michael Corleone or whoever. And great book. Ah. Hey, thanks very much, James. Thanks for having me on. It's always great to talk to you. I'll be on anytime you want me to. And I'm going to take you up on that. You shouldn't have said that. Now you're in trouble. I mean, I've sort of wanted to reach out to you and I thought, ah, you know, I don't want to bug James, you know, but uh, so anytime. And because and thanks for being so for doing your homework and actually, you know, reading the stuff of mine so that, you know, you, you know what you're talking about. It was, it was my pleasure. Thank you for writing it. All right. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.